Morning, everyone. I'm really, really excited about the conference so far. I'm excited to see so many of you here after uh, having such an obviously good time yesterday and last night. So thanks for coming out. I'll try to make it worth your while. As Igor said, I've been working in the data realm for quite a while. Um, I've also been a member of the Ember core team for a couple years now, and uh, I'm particularly thrilled to be working more closely with the Ember data team to help answer some of the questions about the future of data in Ember. What a nebulous topic. <laughs> Let's try to fill in this blank. Is the future of data in Ember web standards? Or perhaps always a step ahead of web standards? Is it real time? Restful? Graph-based? Operational? Offline? The truth is, the future of data in Ember is what you need it to be. We, as a framework, need to meet you where you are and help you get where you want to be. As you can see on Ember Observer, our ecosystem already contains a number of solutions that answer one or more of these needs independently. And this morning, uh, to make sure we're all awake, I'm going to start off with a little demo. Um, I'm going to build uh, em Emberistas. And uh, the, my PM has made the requirement that this must fetch and display data about some of your favorite Emberistas. Sounds pretty straightforward. On the server side, we'll need a couple endpoints. Also very straightforward. Let's start with the most straightforward client-side solution. Let's use pure fetch, get JSON, and work with POJOs on our client side. So in our contacts route, or Emberistas route, perhaps, the model, the model hook uh, performs a fetch at the V1 endpoint for getting the contacts, and then returns that response as, as uh, parse JSON. So let's see what we've built here. Just a very straightforward master detail read-only application. And so far, only web standards have been used. OK, so we kept it as simple and uncomplicated as possible. So a new re requirement has come in that's going to put us to the test. Emberistas must now work offline. Let's just double check that it doesn't. We're going to switch off our network. And yep, there's the downasaur. So yeah, we're out of luck. We have some work to do. The answer is also a web standard, service workers. We are on the cusp of a day that many of us have waited for a long time for, in which service workers are supported across all the evergreen browsers, desktop and mobile. And we're lucky uh, 
to have good folks like Martin Schulstra from Dockyard, who's built some add-ons focused on uh, implementing service workers as easily as possible. So we're going to install those add-ons in our Ember app. We're going to do a little minimal configuration. Uh, we need to specify the static assets that will be cached in the service worker layer. The service worker acts as a proxy between the application and the network layer. And it can do caching. Um, it can do, it can do um, cache, cache first, um, cache, uh, uh, fulfillment of requests, or it can attempt to perform a fetch and then, um, and then only fall back to the cache if, if needed, if that fetch fails. So here we're pointing our fallback cache to watch the requests that go out to the API v1 endpoints and to cache all of those. So now, with that minimal configuration, we are back online, we go back, we go offline, and we refresh. Our data is still there, despite our network not. So we've gotten all this way with pure web standards with no formal data layer. Of course, we're not done. Next is a requirement to add admin pages to edit Emberistas. Doesn't need to work offline. This is an admin area. Um, seems like it might be used mostly on the desktop. So we are going to need some new server-side endpoints. So we're creating a V2 API with some new endpoints to do basic CRUD. And we're going to upgrade our data layer from pure web standards to use Ember data. We're going to introduce a model. And in our routes, we're going to access this Ember data store that's um, injected into all of our routes. And we're going to, in this case, we're going to find all the, the contacts, all the instances of the model. So it does a lot more than that, but it's pretty basic CRUD and follows the same guidelines you see on the, uh, in the Ember guides. So I, I won't go in depth into the implementation. But basically, we now can view the, our, our Emberistas. We can edit them. We can, um, we can do any CRUD operation. We can delete them. I felt only right deleting myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and hey, we can even welcome our, the newest member of our family, Melanie Sumner. So. And there she is. The story doesn't end there. <laughs> Turns out our, our project manager uh, is seeing a real call for using our app, which is, of course, booming in, in uh, popularity, uh, seeing a real, a, a real uh, increase in the request to, uh, to use us on the train, and people's uh, networks are uh, a little flaky. And uh, so those admin pages that weren't required to work offline, now, now she wants those to work offline. So we can use the same RESTful endpoints that we implemented already. And now we're going to introduce a new 
uh, data layer, um, Orbit, uh, which is accessible from, uh, for, for the Ember world through the Ember add-on, Ember Orbit. So let's just take a look at the end result. So we're going to, you can see the, the Orbit logs um, in the console. Um, we're now offline. We're adding a couple more of our favorite Emberistas, uh, the Tomster, and you can see the network requests are failing in the log because it's offline, but Orbit is keeping them queued up and retrying at that network, those network requests until you go back, we go back online and they get pushed through. The queues get emptied and we refresh and Zoe and Tomster are still there. So we were able to seamlessly ride through that network outage um, even if we opened our, uh, our app when it was offline. So uh, that's, that's another level of working offline. Now, need, none of these steps that we've gone through has come cheaply. Take it from me, <laughs> the guy who feels that cost very viscerally when he decides to put together not just one, but three demos on the, on the day before his talk. So, and every upgrade felt like a rewrite of, of the whole data layer. Look at the additions required to implement Orbit and Ember Orbit in our application. We needed to add uh, data buckets to cache application state. We needed to add data sources to, to store our data in index DB when, uh, in, case the, in case the browser gets closed and we reopen it. We don't want to lose data that's in flight or queued up. We, we also need strategies implemented. I'm going to go into some of these details about Orbit later in this talk. But the point is that we've, in, in the reasonable course of developing a single Ember application, we've built three pretty independent data layers. Now, each one of them worked, but the upgrade costs were pretty high because they're pretty independent. How do we allow apps to evolve with less friction. Do we want to blur the boundaries between our data layers, our, our data solutions? Or maybe the shape of a solution is less of a Venn diagram and more linear, in which we add capabilities and accept a proportional complexity cost. There should be an easy on-ramp, heavily based in standards where possible. As an application needs more complexity, it can incrementally augment its capabilities. And applications only need to accept the costs of the complexity that they truly need. Every augmentation should require little to no additional configuration. And what's more, each functional layer should be delineated well enough to allow it to be replaced by compatible layers. Now, this sounds pretty abstract, so let's make it more real with a case study that started five years ago. Ember Camp 2013 meant a lot to me. It was the very first time I gave a conference talk. 
And it was also the very first time I met in person a lot of uh, the, the, the people who had become my friends working, working in the early days of Ember. It was, it was pretty fun to watch uh, Yehuda channel Johnny Ive with his uh, keynote. And uh, at the same time, others uh, channeled their, uh, their inner Spice Girl. <laughs> and I mustered my courage to give this talk, Optimizing an API for Ember Data. It was very much about convention over configuration, a core value of both Rails and Ember. The talk focused on a backend library, Active Model Serializers, fulfilling the data needs of a front end, Ember Data, with a REST adapter. What it turned out to be was actually not just one contract, but a bunch of micro contracts. And it was OK, because those contracts were evolving. They, we'd, we'd say, OK, well, this is how we're going to post records. Um, OK, well, we can tweak the server side. We'll, or or this, is, you know, this is the, the, the document structure we're going to use. Uh, OK, well, we can tweak Ember Data's REST adapter. Well, obviously, that was a, a bit little fragile. In, in, in the long run, and not, not very, um, not a long-term solution. But it was a necessary step because it allowed us to um, to actually let a good solution come through. And it it took quite a while to from that beginning solution to Yehuda's first draft of the JSON API spec in 2013 to version one of JSON API in 2015. JSON API provided a single contract between the back end and the front end. It defined the document structure and the protocol usage at the API layer. It unlocked flexibility. You didn't need to use AMS on the back end. Maybe you were a Java shop, or maybe you had a preferred Rails lib, like JSON API resources. A new adapter showed up in Ember Data, the JSON API adapter, which was tailored to JSON API, which was different from the original REST adapter. Similarly, Orbit can work with JSON API, with a JSON API source. That's what Orbit calls uh, data sources. Netflix just put out fast JSON API uh, serializer. That could also work. Basically, both ends are swappable. There are now over 50 server libraries and 50 client libraries written in 14 languages on each end implementing JSON API. Now, I don't guarantee that they're all as, as good as one, one or the other, but obviously they were all written by people who had particular needs, had particular itches to scratch. And they're all based around this single spec. And you can review them at JSONAPI.org, and you can choose your particular client uh, language and framework and server language and framework and pick one that's right for you. So what's the secret sauce here? It's composable, well-defined interfaces. JSON API defines a document structure and protocol usage. It's compliant with HTTP. We went from the AMS Ember Datas monolithic full stack solution in which the back end and front end were tightly bound with all those micro contracts 
to a single point of connection, the JSON API spec. And that provided a new degree of freedom, which unlocked interchangeable components. So how does JSON API do on our incremental adoption scale? At its most basic, following only the musts in the spec, JSON API specifies a very simple HTTP compliant RESTful API with a slightly opinionated document structure. You can start with the most basic CRUD implementation. But as you move up a level, you may adopt advanced concerns, such as compound documents, hypermedia links, filtering, sparse field sets, and more. There's another layer we're building on top of that. Version 1.1 should come out this year and will include concepts of operations, which allow multiple single requests in the base spec to be serialized together and performed together transactionally, which unlocks creating multiple related resources together. Local identities, local to the document, can uh, bind those resources together. So you'll be able to create a graph of data in a single request, and it will succeed or fail. I'm pretty excited about this. It's been, it's been a long time coming. So let's talk about Ember data. How can we apply lessons from JSON API to Ember data? First of all, what, you know, what are Ember data's goals? I think a good goal is for it to serve the needs of over 80% of Ember applications. And as needs shift, Ember data should evolve to align with those needs. This is the evergreen relationship goal here. And, and how can it do that? It can use the same secret sauce that JSON API does. It, composability, extensibility, unlocked by well-defined interfaces. In fact, it already has some well-defined interfaces and degrees of freedom. The store can be connected to an adapter and a serializer. And just like JSON API has a breadth of implementations in its ecosystem. If you look at Ember Observer, you can see that Ember Data also uh, has many implementations that serve many different needs at the adapter and serializer layer. One issue that the team is actively addressing is the tight coupling that currently exists between the store and the model. There's a lot of internal private code, which unfortunately, for out of necessity, has become semi-private code or in intimate code. And uh, add-ons add -ons rely on this. And, uh, and so we've got, a bit of, we've got a bit of a bind there, because a lot of add-ons need that functionality that can only be accessed by, through those intimate APIs that exist between the store and the model. And we need to give, a, provide a way for those add-ons to evolve. So that's where Igor's record data RFC comes in. The record data interface formalize the interface between the store and the model and allow add-ons to deal with that, that well-defined interface. 
And by defining that new interface, we can unlock experimentation. Perhaps Ember data models are a little heavyweight for your application. Maybe there's a, a memory cost, and you want, you'd be fine using POJOs. Um, maybe immutable data structures could add some real benefits to your app, like allowing for cheap store forking. Uh, we can implement static analysis at the model layer to generate a schema. We, or go the other way with schemaless models. There's a lot of experimentation that we're, we can unlock, and we can unlock in a forward-looking way that can be maintained and advanced and deprecated in the same way we're all used to. So let's look at Ember Data's incremental adoption of capability scale here. Right now, the very core of Ember Data still relies on uh, a store, models, basic CRUD. We're looking at potentially shrinking that even further. Perhaps there's an in-between path between our, uh, our web standards example, which relied on fetch, and a full-blown Ember data example, where we recognize the value of an identity map of sharing a single canonical record per, uh, across an application. It's especially important when you're, using, when you're mutating data. So, so if we at least provided a store to those applications, it might provide a, little, a better on-ramp to go from straight fetch uh, with POJOs to uh, using full-blown Ember data with adapters and serializers and everything that comes along with them. So that's, that's a bit of a, a question mark exactly where those lines will be drawn, but this is all about the future and experimentation. So. So at the next layer of uh, capabilities, it's with Ember Data, it's typically uh, the domain of add-ons, where partial records, embedded records, change sets, it's a lot of interesting experimentation going on already in the Ember Data ecosystem. And perhaps, just like JSON API has a a next level, perhaps Ember Data also has a next level. And that's really what I've been exploring for the last few years with my work on Orbit. Orbit, which was the third example um, in our Emberistas uh, app, is a data access and synchronization library. It aims to be a universal data layer. It's seeing adoption across uh, a number of frameworks and in back, back end, but mostly front end. It's written in TypeScript, but of course ships plain uh, JavaScript and is fully compatible with any flavor of JavaScript. So why, why did I work on Orbit? What, what were the use cases that were driving it? Why, why didn't I try to unlock those use cases directly in Ember Data. Well, they, they, it was a real challenge, and uh, some of them involved some new primitives. So let's take a look at what those use cases are. What we've seen already is just one, the offline case. In an increasingly connected mobile world, offline is critical for web applications, PWAs to compete with native, On the other end, Orbit allows for very, a very simple uh, model where you have a single source and uh, can work without a backend. You can also connect multiple sources that share an, uh, the same interface and swap one out for another. For example, if you're 
using a, um, an, an app that needs to store application state in browser storage, you're, and you're, you're, you're not sure if the browser supports um, IndexedDB, you could provide a fallback to local storage. And you could swap them out at runtime. One of the main challenges that's been so hard to get right is data synchronization. I increasingly, applications are not just one or the other type. They're not just dealing with one, one type of data, real, real time um, or restful or you know, from multiple services. They, they need to make sense of that data, synchronize it, and present it to the user. And that can be a, be a really hard problem. Also, um, I've, I've found that creating forms and editing structures that you can reason about easily it has been a challenge. And just providing strict isolation between um, between canonical data in a store and, and edited data seemed critical. So I wanted to be able to allow for complex edits that could be committed or in a single transaction or thrown away. And if we're getting that deterministic about tracking our changes, then that unlocks things like undo and redo and really, optimistic UI is just uh, another, another term for uh, offline. It's another way of thinking about offline. You can provide some benefits when you're online um, by not waiting for the request response cycle to show that uh, actions have happened. And so this doesn't apply for all types of data if you're going to process an invoice or something, you probably want to wait for that request response cycle. But there are times when, um, when you can be optimistic, like say you're making a note or a time entry or something like that, that doesn't need to wait. That's probably just going to exist in, in, in your browser until, until you upload it. So I won't get too in depth with Orbit, but the basics are that it considers all sources of data with a, with a, a base class, a single interface, um, with, with specialized interfaces implemented on top of that. Um, it synchronizes normalized data between sources and provides flow control so that you can have actions that block, uh, that depend upon other actions completing. And this is all enabled through events uh, and event handlers listening um, and returning promises if they want to block. And the Orbit store uh, uses a cache that's uh, modeled on, uh, that, that tracks changes like Git, it tracks inverse changes, and can uh, basically roll back any changes or reset. You can fork, fork stores uh, create branches, throw away those, those branches. And this is unlocked through the use of immutable data structures under the hood. So let's take a, take a look at how you might incrementally access Orbit's capabilities. You could start very simply with a single source and a schema. That's the bare minimum. And you could then, like a memory, memory source, a store, that you could query. Next level, you might want to connect multiple sources with coordination strategies, state buckets. State buckets are important to maintain. Each source can, um, can use a state bucket to maintain everything that is in, in memory, application state, that should be persisted to, um, uh, you know, so that if, the brow if your browser goes down unexpectedly, all those queues, all those logs stay, will be uh, 
revived, rehydrated when it comes back. And then at like the last frontier are people who are using Orbit to create custom sources, uh, particular to their own types of data. Um, you can create new query ops. There's a generalized uh, query and update language which, uh, which could be adapted to support any type of operation, like, queer, like Orbit could eventually support uh, GraphQL, for instance, as, as an operation type in, in queries or GraphQL mutation. So it's pretty general purpose. It's certainly not specific to JSON API. So how do I see Orbit fitting in with Ember data? Well, as we've, as we've already seen with Ember data's incremental scale, there's a big question mark, big, a lot of question marks at that upper end. You know, where, where does it go? What's next? I see actually a lot of issues opened in uh, the Ember data RFCs and, and the repo about you know, pushing advanced capabilities. And I'm hopeful that those advanced capabilities that we all need as a community line up with a lot of what Orbit provides. So I think you could consider this analogy, that Orbit is to Ember data as Glimmer is to Ember. And this makes a whole lot more sense when you look at the logos. <laughs> so this works in a couple ways. Ember data can provide Orbit's capabilities in a convention-driven package. Remember all those configuration files I had to add to that Orbit app to make it all work? We're a convention over configuration community, we can apply those same strategies at, at the data layer and unlock advanced features for all of us without a lot of sweat. And another way that Orbit is like Glimmer, or Glimmer JS, you might say, is that Orbit and its ecosystem can provide a laboratory for experimentation in the same way that we sanded down a lot of the rough spots on Glimmer components before they landed in Ember. So we've now reached the part of this talk that I'll regret. <laughs> Every prediction so far has been a carefully extrapolated hedge that I feel quite confident about. But to give a talk with the future in the title without going out on a limb might be deeply unsatisfying, like, um, I don't, like pushing out a major release to a framework without any new features at all. <laughs> anyway, here goes nothing. I'm put, taking out my crystal ball and saying that, yes, GraphQL is onto something. GraphQL usage will continue to grow, and Apollo will continue to innovate. There's a lot of interesting things happening there. REST plus solutions like JSON API 1.1 will also grow. They also provide graph, uh, graphical structures, uh, views into data. They also provide with, through operations an alternative to GraphQL mutations. And that operations primitive will be adopted across the stack, not just on the client side, but flowing through to the server. And static analysis will be key in all of our work, not just at the data layer, but also in, in the broader framework uh, to improve runtime efficiency. And from my experience with immutable data structures, we can get most of the power, most of the, the positives from them without the pain points by 
keeping their usage internal and fairly isolated from the application layer so that they're used under the hood, so that you can fork a store with 10,000 records in it by copying a reference or two. That's a, that, there's a lot of power there. But we don't want to use custom accessors to access every single, every single piece of data in, in, um, in those, uh, directly in those structures. And I strongly believe with the, uh, with the advent of service workers in all our evergreen browsers, demand for offline PWAs will, will really grow. And web apps will truly compete with native apps on so many fronts. And this is maybe wishful thinking, but since I have the crystal ball out, I really, I really have, am seeing a lot of excitement from different communities about Orbit. So it's clearly meeting a need that others, others are not providing. So I, I will go out on a limb and, and, and ho hope that that trend continues. I'll put the crystal ball away, though, and provide some guarantees. I'll, I'll say that we need to make it a goal that you should be able to incrementally adopt new capabilities in your application as you need them. You should be able to start with primitives, with, with standards, as, as little as possible. Add capabilities, accept complexity costs only as needed, and only venture into the red zone <laughs> when you really need to, and you're doing something really advanced. But hopefully, each step of the way is unlocked by little to no configuration and strong boundaries between these functional layers, which allows for swapping and new solutions can be generated. So in closing, I'm not only really excited about what's going on in data, I'm, th I'm thrilled to see what's going on across the ecosystem. I think the keynote yesterday just laid, laid it out so well. And I feel like this year, is a great year for all of us to reach out and share what's going on in the Ember ecosystem with the broader JavaScript community. As, we're, as our applications, as our framework has modernized and is second to none, our performance stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with Preact. Our conventions are as well thought out as any. I'd love to see more folks sharing their experiences with each other at Ember meetups, at conferences like this, but also at broader JavaScript conferences, because I think there's a lot of good stuff to share. And I think it goes both ways, and we can, we can all learn, um, learn from each other. It's a, it's a great, Ember's part of a larger ecosystem, and it's, it's really great. So, um, please, please get out there and, and spread the good word. And uh, let's build great things together. Thanks.